introducing uh, Commissioner of Health, Dr. Edward Ellinger, uh, who, as you know, is the Minnesota Commissioner of Health and was appointed to serve the Commissioner of Health in uh, January of 2011 and just this year reappointed. Um, congratulations uh, for that. And, and I'm, uh, as you know, he's responsible for the work at the Minnesota Department of Health as the public health agency, and which is uh, really responsible for protecting and maintaining and improving the health of all of Minnesotans. Um, and in terms of the, the Minnesota Health Initiative, uh, the legislature has uh, actually charged the commissioner with the responsibility for overseeing the, the work of the Health Advisory Committee, and we greatly appreciate uh, his uh, commitment to that effort. And in fact, um, not only his uh, his uh, amazing uh, work as commissioner, but he's been pre he's also president elect of all state health officers in an organization called ASTO, Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, this year, and will begin to serve his presidency shortly. Yes. September. Congratulations! Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Edward Ellinger. Well, thank you, Marty, and uh, good morning, everyone. I know I'm the last thing at this, at this long morning, but uh, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk, because I think what I'm going to say actually lays a lot of the foundation and, and framework for what David just talked about, so thank you for that, uh, that, those remarks, that it really is a public health perspective. And it's really interesting, I was, earlier this morning, was on a panel at the Academy Health Conference that's going on, and uh, and it was sponsored by, that panel was sponsored by RWJF, so there's that, that synergy. Also, your, your keynote tomorrow, uh, Dr. Katz from LA County Public Health. Uh, LA County Public Health was also on the panel that I was on uh, this morning uh, and was talking about value and predictive analytics. Uh, so I think a lot of the, what is going on around the world is actually coming together. Um, you know, they, we heard about these, these, these simple rules, you know, they, and we just learned, I just learned about simple rules. These simple rules will, in complex situations actually helps the complex situation to organize. So like with a flock of birds, if the simple rule is fly to the middle, don't go any faster or slower than your partner, and don't bang into each other. And with that simple rule, they form into flocks and actually move it in complex behavior. And I think there are some simple rules that are, that are coming forward. Uh, around all of our world about health care and health and community organizing and community development because uh, we're following some simple rules. We want to have a healthy community. We want everybody engaged. We want the needs met in a responsible way. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I think particularly uh, welcome to Happy Blooms Day uh, for all of you. This is the day of the year when in uh, Ulysses' novel, or in James Joyce's novel, Ulysses, um, and um, it's a very long book, about 265,000 words, a lexicon of about 30,000 words. Uh, it's not understandable to many folks because there's a lot of puns, a lot of uh, stream of consciousness, uh, a lot of metaphors. Uh, it's really under not understandable. It's controversial, some people even call it obscene. And yet it's been named one of the most, it was named one of the most influential and important novels of the 20th century. And it's sort of like e-health, I think. <laughs> it's big, it's complex, I understand, but it's so influential. Um, but, but as you pointed out, David, we're, we're doing some things in Minnesota to make that happen, to make it understandable, to make it influential. And by the way, please invest in Minnesota. We would love to have you invest in Minnesota. Um, and, and some of the reason we have that is because of the leadership that we have. Certainly Marty's in, uh, leadership has really been influential in bringing us together. He's a collaborator and he understands the fact, you know, what's your statement, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go long, far, go as a team or as a group or yeah. go collectively as a herd. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then certainly our, our uh, e-health advisory committee and all the folks that are on it. And Alan Abrahamson has been just wonderful in that and certainly Bobby McAdam has also been very good on this, and so I want to particularly recommend or commend her today uh, for the work that she has done on co-chairing the eHealth Advisory Committee. 
Um, you know, she's been really a leader in a whole variety of ways in identifying standards and barriers to implementing e-health. She's developed uh, our interoperability guide as sort of some leadership in that and certainly some guidance and discussions on statewide responses to uh, proposed national rules. Uh, Bobby has really just done a wonderful job and I really want her to come up and get an award from us, a recognition from, from us for her work on the e-health advisory committee. All right, so we've got a little thing here. It says, on behalf of the Minnesota Department of Health, thank you for your service as co-chair of the Minnesota E-Health Advisory Committee. You have provided indispensable leadership to the committee and to the community in this important role. So, Bobby, thank you very much. It's, it's Bobby McAdam, Director of Initial Day, but it's also the anniversary of the death of Hammurabi. Um, <laughs> He was the <laughs> king of Babylon, and his name comes from the word Amarapi, which means the kinsman is a healer. And I think that reflects what leadership is all about. Leadership is about healing. It's actually about paying attention to the good of the community. And I think Hammurabi uh, also was the one who, who solidified some a code of behavior, a code of ethics. That was the first one. And you probably can't see that very well, but on the bottom it says the Great Society Program. I think this was, he, he pre-led uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson in terms of the Great Society Program. And, uh, and you can see, actually he paid attention to the, you know, the art person over here was talking about arts and different way of learning, seeing the world. Uh, wanted the, the surplus of the community actually to support artisans and craftspeople, uh, recognizing that was important. But you also notice that the worker there was bringing all of the food that had to be distributed to all of the, uh, the hierarchy in there. But one of the first rules of the Code of Hammurabi was, and I'm sorry you can't see that, for some reason my formatting was a little different. It says, the first duty of government is to protect the powerless from the powerful. Uh, and I think that is the code that he recognized that we are all in this together and we have to protect. That's one of the role of government. And certainly the, the code of Hammurabi uh, also had some things. It was all about value and accountability. I think that was one of the things that he had. And I thought these were sort of interesting as we're having a conversation about health and e-health. If a physician operates on a man and causes that man's death, they shall cut off his fingers. Uh, you know, there's accountability of some sort in terms of value. <laughs> But I think, I think about our e-health system with this, this next code of the rule of Hammurabi. If a builder builds a house, or if a builder builds an e-health system for a community and does not make its construction firm and the house collapses and causes the death of the owner, that builder shall be put to death. <laughs> it, we don't want to get to that, but it talks about the importance of what we are doing and how we really need to think more broadly in terms of the impact that it has on the community and the people that we're working for. It is not just, you know, build a house and think, well, who cares? What's... No, build a quality house because it is so important. Build an e-health system that is really quality, that is sound, that really actually protects people. That is part of a job, not only for overall, but protecting the powerless from the powerful. And certainly that is what you know, you're talking about those rules of Hammurabi, value and accountability, and that's certainly what eHealth has been doing over the last 10, 11 years to accelerate the adoption and use of electronic health records, to offer information technology, to improve the healthcare quality, to improve patient safety, reduce healthcare costs, and improve public health. We're building a structure to do all of those wonderful things. And that ties in certainly with the triple aim of, of uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement or the Institute of Medicine better care for individuals, lower per capita costs, better health for populations. That's the value proposition. But that value has a real economic ring to it. And I think as we think about the Code of Hammurabi, there's another value that's there. You know, the value or principle or code. Why are we doing this in the first place? What is the value that we add to society as a whole? And that's where I think that we've really been focusing on and we really do need to focus on. And certainly, as health commissioner in this state, I think that the value that we have 
and again, I can't see it really, assuring health equity and optimal health for all is the value that we have to have. That is the central focus that we have in this state, and I think this is the central focus that we have to have in this country if we're going to be really build a system that protects everybody, that really improves the health of everybody. Health equity and optimal health for all. And you can see why we need to do that. The chart on the lower left is the changing demography of our, our, our country, and Minnesota reflects that. We're becoming an increasingly diverse society. And on the right side, it shows the infant mortality rate disparities between blacks and whites on infant mortality. And you can see that there's huge disparities around the country. And certainly in this state, we have some huge disparities in infant mortality between people of color and American Indians and the white population. Uh, and so it is a math problem, certainly, is if we don't deal with those disparities, we will not be continue to be a healthy country or state on average. It's, it's a math problem, but it really is a social justice problem in that we really have to pay attention to everybody in our society. And you know that, that those infant mortality, I raise that just because I'm a pediatrician and worked in maternal and child health most of my public health career, but that the infant mortality is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of disparities. If you look at any other factor, the racial and ethnic disparities, the income disparities are huge in terms of outcomes. And that's one of the things that we really have to focus on. So how have we tried to focus on that? Well, in our world, we, we have this, this philosophy that, you know, it's, you know, the individual bootstraps. You pick yourself up by the bootstrap. Just work hard and committed, you will do well. And you have that free market around you to, to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship and that competition is really gonna move us forward. And as little government as possible to get in the way of all of that entrepreneur. Uh, and technology is, is really important. That's, and, and that's the framework that we have in terms of how we really look at addressing the problems in this country. Uh, and education is becoming more in terms of job training as opposed to really educating in the broader sense. And structural discrimination really is a thing of the past. That's the common mantra, that's the frame that, that in, in the world view, the narrative that we see in terms of how we address problems, how we address big social situations. And that is the framework that actually has led to the, the common narrative about what creates health. That if people would be healthy, if they just had good medical care, made good choices about diet, physical activity, and substance use. Uh, that it was about personal choices and, and health care. Well, we know that that's not the case. Uh, we know that the social determinants of health, the socioeconomic circumstances, play at least a 40% role in our overall health. And we've talked a little bit about collecting those data uh, that really impact those, how can we address those social determinants of health, the socioeconomic factors. And the other 30% is behaviors. You know, that sort of ties into that common narrative until you start to really look at the fact of, you know, let's look at where people live. Look at the people on the left. If you live in a community with parks and walking paths and good grocery stores and good schools and good transportation, home ownership, and what you can't see on the bottom is IT connectivity, if you live in those kinds of communities, the choice, healthy choice, is an easy choice. You actually have some choices about what you can do. But look on the other side. You know, if you live in a community with fast food restaurants and lots of liquor stores and limited transportation and no home ownership, uh, lots of foreclosures and limited IT connectivity, it's hard to make healthy choices. So I believe that, that the behavior aspect is really not 30%. That socioeconomic factor actually limits what people choices have, the choices that people have, so that the socioeconomic circumstances in which people live and work and play and pray uh, are really, really the factors that influence our health. And we certainly see that in the Twin Cities area. I hope all of you have seen this map before where you look along the I-94 corridor and you see 13 years of difference in life expectancy within just a couple of miles. It's not because people choose to live in neighborhoods where you have high mortality rates, where your longevity is limited. You don't choose to do that. You're actually forced to live in those neighborhoods because of the opportunities that you don't have growing up, that you don't have as part of a, a community, For, forced to by the policies that we put in place over the years that, that we've had. 
So I think in our state, one of our biggest challenges is really to advance health equity. And our advancing health equity report identified, the again, the fact that social economic factors are the greatest determinants of health, that things are the way they are. Both the health and the health inequities are there because we designed them that way. And that the roots of those designs are really, a lot of it is based on structural racism, where it's not individual racism necessarily, but we set in terms in place policies that have structurally disadvantaged some populations over others. Good example is the Central Corridor Light Rail when we started putting that together, that the metric was move people from Minneapolis to St. Paul or vice versa as rapidly as possible. And that was the metric. People in the middle along the midway said, wait a minute, we're being left out in this. And so they did a health impact assessment and identified what housing and transportation and education would be impacted by the lack of stops or by the presence of stops and recognized that it was going to impact their health in dramatic ways. If they didn't have the stops, it would go down. If they had the stops, it would go up. And that actually changed the, the Department of Transportation's metric on how they evaluate uh, uh, transportation systems now that you have to pay attention not only to the costs and the the efficiency metric but you have to pay attention to the community those were data that were used to make policy decisions and I think the greatest uh, factors that we can do in terms of improving health is really looking at policy decisions and you'll see this in a little bit and so I think we need to make a commitment to a fundamental shift in our paradigm both about what constitute evidence, talking over here again from you know, some of the other ways of, of looking at health. We need to really look at what constitutes evidence. And we have to be, have some conversations about who's involved in the decision making. Really important. If we're gonna deal with the community, the community has to be engaged. And we have to talk about what creates health. And I've got three kind of simple rules. And we talked about the simple rules of flying in a flock. I have three simple rules, I think of how we're going to advance health equity. First, expand our understanding about what creates health. That means we have to change the narrative about what creates health. And I think we have a framework for that from what the World Health Organization and the Commission on Social Determinants of Health put together. You know, yes, we need to focus on individual health and health equity. That's at the far right. And a lot of our work has been around that looking at the material circumstances, the social circumstances, the behavioral and psychological factors, those are actually the social determinants of health. And our health system really focuses on that, focuses on the individual and the living conditions in which people live, and that's really, really important. As a physician who's cared for patients, that has to be part of the conversation, to dealing with those social determinants of health. But really looking at what impacts those living conditions well, those, and that's really important. And if you notice those arrows, it's a one-way arrow. You know, your living conditions don't impact the things on the left. It's the things on the left that impact your living conditions. And that means your education, your occupation, your income. And those are really you know, determined by a whole lot of factors. Uh, certainly gender, social values, racism as one of those things. And those are really the factors that influence living conditions. And what, how the, our gender and income, or income and education and employment and occupation affected, they're really affected by the larger policies, the larger national state policies uh, that really focus on, on the living conditions. And these are called the social determinants of health and equities. And that's where we really have to make our, a, a change of our focus. And that's where data can really be important in helping look at some of those macro policies, macroeconomic policies, macro education policies, macro policies across the board. Um, and you can see this is where uh, the, the whole map pulled together. We spend a lot of time, we spend 95% of our resources on that the first two boxes, individual and the, the social determinants of health in an individual basis. And we really need to start focusing even further left onto that. And I think that's particularly important because I really believe that, that health data and health information technology are social determinants of health and they're social determinants of health inequities. Social determinants of health are things that really impact your health but you don't have individual control over. And I think that's big data and I think longitudinal data are really important in certainly doing that. So that is 
One of the rules that we have to change the narrative about what creates health. It's not just medical care. Medical care is important, don't get me wrong, really important. We have to do it well. We have to have culturally competent care, but we're not going to treat ourselves into health. We need that, it, but we have to focus on the policies and the systems and environment that impacts the larger scope in which we live and work. And so some of the questions that we have to raise every time we're talking about that, we have to say, what values do you bring to the decision-making table? What values are in the decision-making process? What's assumed to be true about the world? That gets back to the narrative about what your, your, your narrative about what creates health and what standards of success are being applied at different levels and by whom. So this is one of the first rules. The second rule is that we have to strengthen community capacity to create their own healthy futures. And we're trying to do that in this state in a variety of ways. And we have lots of different examples of how this, but three that I just want to highlight, certainly our state health improvement program, or SHIP, uh, where we have throughout the, uh, throughout the state, in every county or multi-county district, a state health improvement program where you have a community leadership team, which includes public health and health care, but also includes education and the business community. Uh, everybody in the community with a community leadership team who's making the decisions about how to invest appropriately in the health of that community. Uh, we also have our eHealth initiative, which really, really gets input from across the state with multiple stakeholders, really making decisions about what impacts health in communities throughout the state. And then our state innovation model, or SIM grant, which is using the data and a whole variety of other things to, to come together to create accountable care organizations, but then embedding them into our communities as accountable communities of health. And certainly what we're seeing here with, in, related to SHIP, just one chart shows what we can do if we really work at a community level. This is obesity curve in Minnesota compared to our surrounding states. The green line is the obesity rate in Minnesota. We've bent the curve because we've invested in policy system, environmental change strategies at the local level compared to Iowa, Wisconsin, and North and South Dakota where their lines continue to follow the national curve and going up. They've not taken the same approach in terms of policy system, environment change, and really embedding, engaging the community and empowering the community to make decisions about what they want to do and how to invest resources at the local level. And certainly, I'm not going to go into all the numbers. You know, you've heard some of the numbers already about the e-health uh, work. But we're, we're doing a lot of really good work. I think we're bending the curve on the usability and the function of how e-health can be used to really improve health. Uh, and I say, you know that better than I, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But then we have our, our, SHIP, our, our state innovation model, our SIM grants where we're really looking at a whole variety of things. Patient, the payment models, the coordination of care, certainly HIT and data and interoperability, uh, and then developing accountable care, and then embedding that accountable care into a community. And so I actually, Dave, I was that your slide about community health and wellness, I actually have that in usual my slide presentations, but I actually modified it a little bit for this presentation. And so I have this little bit more of a mosaic because healthcare is embedded in all of these things. And I like, for, I, I frequently say, I do not want healthcare to be responsible for health. I do not want public health to be responsible for health. I want the community to be responsible for health. And public health and medical care and clinical care are part of that community and we play our role. But I have just one example that I use before I became Commissioner of Health, I ran the health service, Boynton Health Service at the University of Minnesota. And I reported as, and, and Boynton was both a public health agency and a primary care clinic. But we reported to the student fees committee for our funding. It really was a single payer system actually. Uh, where the student fee was the tax that students put on themselves and then the students decided how to invest those dollars. Would they invest in rec sports? Would they invest in the student union? Would they invest in the parent-student cultural centers? Would they invest in health care? Would, would they invest in a whole variety of things? They decided. So I had to go to the fees committee one year, and I, our clinic was being really busy. Urgent care was busy. Our health, we were having lots of injuries. And I said, we need another primary care doc. I would love to have a primary, another primary care doc. Can we add that to our budget? And they said, you might need that but you know what we really need? We need a van for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. 
because it's not safe for students to travel at that point in time. And I'm sure it was from the library to home. <laughs> but they said, and you have the infrastructure at Boynton to, to, to really put together a transportation program. So they gave us the money for a transportation program and not for a primary care doc. Guess what happened? Primary, our urgent care visits went down, ER visits went down, our number of, we, some lives were saved because of the, actually the van actually identified some people who were acutely alcohol poisoned, got them to the, the, uh, the ER. Uh, I mean, it really, the community knew better. I had that healthcare lens and the public health lens, they had a community lens. They're, they're, they're complementary, but that's where I say, we really want to embed healthcare into a community. Similarly, IT. I, think, I don't think most people think about broadband connectivity uh, and IT as a really social determinant. It obviously is. And in fact, you know, we've done, and you'll see in a little bit, that we've done some white papers on income and health and paid leave and health. I think we really need to think about broadband access and health. And I think we need to do a health impact assessment on that. So, so as we're talking about the, qualis, the, the great questions to ask, for community capacity, we ask, you know, what are the outcomes and what are the outcomes that we want? Who's benefiting, who is not, and who should be targeted to benefit? And particularly when we're talking about community, this is one that I think we have to reemphasize over and over again. Who's at the decision-making table and who is not? You know, who's protecting the powerless from the powerful? Who has the power at the table? Who should set the decision-making table? And who's being held accountable for what happens at that table? I think we really need that community voice at the table. We need that in all of the decisions that we make. We're certainly asking that at our agency in terms of who's there helping to make some of the decisions. I think we need that at the community level and all the way around. And then the third point for us to, in terms of the simple rules, I think we have to implement a health and all policies approach to assess the process policy and resource decisions that impact health equity. Those are the things that really impact health. It's the policies and the processes and the symptoms. Yes, service delivery is important. The work on one-on-one -on -one is really important, but it's the global aspects that are really important. We're trying to do that with our Healthy Minnesota 2020, where we brought people together from all over the, the state from different sectors to really look at what we're doing in our Healthy Minnesota 2020 partnership and look at the indicators that we were really looking at in terms of our public health indicators that we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to. The top prenatal care in breastfeeding, certainly, but then food security, uh, high school graduation, per capita income, sense of safety, uh, home ownership and incarceration justice. Those are public health indicators that we really need to focus on. And we need data to be able to identify how we're doing on that. And certainly, these are some of the things that we're working on to really look at those policy and system and environmental change strategies. The impact, the health impact of marriage. Trying to look at that added to the conversation about same-sex marriage, about how marriage itself is a health indicator, has helped uh, certainly ban the box, incarceration, and how it impacts health. Our impact on our health, white paper that showed that increasing somebody from the lowest quintile of income to the second lowest in, in, quintile of income, a relatively small change, increases life expectancy by about three and a half years. Huge impact for that kind of an investment. And our paid leave and health report that we just pointed, uh, put out a couple of months ago, that again showed that if you had paid leave, sick leave and paternity, maternity leave, family leave, actually impacts infant mortality, impacts uh, immunization rates, it impacts the health of the mother and the baby, and it impacts the health of the community. And do you know who does not have access to paid leave? People of color and American Indians and low income populations and poorly educated. That's structural racism in that the people who really need it don't have it, and those people mostly are people of color and American Indians, low income populations. Uh, so those are the things that we're working on. So what would it look like if health equity was a starting point for all of our decision making? I ask you, think about that every time you make a decision about a process or a policy. Put health equity in there. What kind of impact does it have? And we're going for our agency, for the health department folks in here, we're actually working on some questions that we want all of our divisions to start looking at in terms of to evaluate how their processes 
are their policy initiatives are looking how is that health equity question going to be asked i think if we did that our work would be different i think our work has to be different our work has to be about creating the conditions in which people can be healthy because and and that's that's I'll skip but because that's what public health is all about it's about creating the conditions in which people can be healthy and you notice this definition is not about doctors or nurses or clinics or hospitals or even health departments it's about we as a society do collectively it means all of you and all of the people in the community uh, and I think it's appropriate that on this day in uh, 1858 Abraham Lincoln said a house divided against itself cannot stand we can't have the disparities we need to be equitable in our approach everybody needs to be at the table everybody needs to be working collaboratively because a house divided against itself will not stand and a community that has huge disparities that lacks equity will not be a healthy community so that is our challenge and I think you have a huge role to play in that with your work on e-health and in the work of your agencies regardless of what you do they're all together IT Healthcare has to be embedded in that community matrix of transportation and housing and, and uh, economic development and, and criminal justice and public safety and environmental quality. Those all have to be together and we have to get the community at the table and that voice and power to make the decisions because then we will invest the right things at the right time in the right place and we'll be healthier for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, we are at time, and time for lunch, which is out towards the registration desk and down one floor. There's also straight ahead uh, at the end of the tables, there's a stairway there to go downstairs as well. Thank you very much. We'll see you uh, back right after lunch. <laughs>